Welcome back to the lab at home. If you'd like to say hello, we'd love to be able to give you a shout out. If you like in the chat, uh, you can say your name. If you want to say your age and where you're viewing from. Yeah, we'd, we'd love to be able to say hi to you. Hi there, Max. I'll go ahead and introduce myself in the chat as well. And then we will get started here in just a moment. I, I think this is something I probably say at the beginning of a lot of labs when I say like, this is one of my favorite labs, but this is actually one of my favorite labs. I'm, I'm really excited about this one. Hi there, May. All right, friends. Hi there, Galen. Hi there, Violet. I think, um, I think let's go ahead and get started. We have a bunch of cool stuff to talk about today. A big wave to all the rest of my friends out there. Um, welcome back to Lab at Home with the Museum of Life and Science. Um, as always, we hope um, that all of you will help lead our program with your questions and thoughts and ideas in the moderated chat box. Um, I'm really excited to have my friend Caroline with me today. She's a Catalyst volunteer with the lab, um, and I'm so excited to have her as our chat box moderator. So hello to Caroline out there. Um, and I think let's go ahead and get started with our topic for today. So first, let me ask: Is is anyone going to be doing um, is anyone going to be doing the experiment along with us today? Has anyone got the like uh, supplies and stuff to do it along with me? It's totally okay if not, um, because it's definitely something that you can watch me do do later. Oh, it sounds like we've got a couple people. Oh, sweet! Oh, we've got a bunch of people doing it today. That's awesome. All right, friends. Well. What are we doing today? What are, what are we, do we know what, what we're gonna be making? What experiment we're gonna be doing? What do you think? We're talking about polymers today. Specifically, we're talking about kitchen polymers. So types of polymers we can find uh, around our kitchen. Um, and what exactly is a polymer? We talked about it on, not last week, but the week before's lab at home. And does anybody remember what we did? We, we talked about, yeah, yes, we talked about plastics. So last time we talked about regular uh, plastics and how we could determine different types of recyclable plastics. And this time we're talking about plastics polymers, which is uh, all plastics are polymers, and ones that we can make using stuff around our house. So um, when we're talking about plastic, right, we, we'd say that all plastics are polymers. And what that means is that all of the molecules, all of the little teeny, teeny, tiny pieces that make up this material, um, they like to chain together. So there's something that tends uh, to chain together. There's lots of different types um, for conventional plastics. Um, those polymers come from petroleum, which comes from crude oil. Um, and polymers are also present in organic things, like in proteins. So we're going to use one particular ingredient today, and we're going to use the protein polymer inside of it to create a type of plastic. So I asked us to get some milk. And I've got some milk in here. Have you guys got your milk? I'm, I'm really interested to know, did you pick a certain percentage of milk? I know some people uh, like 2% or 1%. Um, I chose fat-free milk uh, just because um, I figure if we're getting the protein out of it, it'll have a little less fat and more uh, protein per volume. We've got uh, low fat. Yeah, and as long as we have dairy milk, it will work. I just figured maybe there's slightly more protein uh, per, per volume if it is a low fat or non-fat. I'll be really interested to see how it works, my friends. So we've got our milk. We know that there's a lot of different stuff in our milk, right? We know that there's, it's a dairy product, there's fats, there's sugars, and there's protein. Even if we look on our nutritional facts, you can see this has eight grams of protein per serving. The protein is what we wanna get out of our milk. But I guess the question is, how do you take the uh, protein out of milk? What we're going to do is we're going to use heat. So I'm going to take about a cup of milk. I'm going to pour it into my little microwave safe uh, uh, cup here. And I'm going to do a cup. 
You're welcome to also do a cup, but um, of course you can, you can use half a cup if you want to start a little bit smaller. You'll just half the rest of our ingredients. There's really only one other ingredient, so that might be pretty simple for you to do. But we're going to start with one cup of milk, and we're going to heat it up. Uh, and that's going to be our first step in taking the protein out. So let me go ahead and I'm going to close my cap here. And I've got a microwave right here. And what I'm going to do is I am going to put it in for about a minute and 30 seconds. Now, um, we'll see what temperature it is when it comes out. But temperature might have to be a little bit approximate. I happen to have a, a thermometer and I know a temperature range that I'm looking for. Um, but go ahead and I guess start yours. Um, try about a minute and 30 seconds and we'll see how it feels. There'll be some other things, even if we don't have a thermometer, that can help us kind of figure out what temperature it is. So I'm gonna go ahead and get my uh, milk heated up in my microwave, minute and 30 seconds. And we'll talk about what other supplies we'll need. All right. So I have got my microwave going. Hopefully that's not super noisy for you guys. Um, I of course have my milk and my cup. The other thing I'm gonna need is an acid. That's the other thing that's gonna help take the protein out of the milk. So I happen to have some um, lemon juice with me, um, but there's other types of uh, household acids that you could use. Um, can I ask what you guys are using for acids? If you're doing it along with us, are you using some um, lemon juice, are you using vinegar, anything else? Oh, vinegar? Yeah, vinegar will work perfectly. Yeah, I used vinegar uh, last time, yeah, for sure. Oh, so you have lemon juice as well. So it sounds like we have a little bit of, uh, of either. Um, both of them will work, and we can use the same amount of both of those. So I have my acid. I've got a few other things. I've got a spoon for stirring. Um, I have got a strainer in a bowl just in case um, uh, when I uh, kind of separate the protein from the milk, if I need to strain it out, I've got those. And then I've, I've got something a little bit extra that's totally optional, but I wanted to include some food coloring just to help us see it a little bit better. I've actually never made this with food coloring, so I'm interested to see how it goes. We'll have to find out. My milk is almost ready here. Um, I went ahead and already uh, measured out my acid. Um, you can do it along with me, or that's my, that's my beak. It's all ready. Got my milk. I'm going to carefully take it out. So I've got my milk here, and I can see that it's steaming. It's pretty warm. I'm going to go ahead to my experiment cam, and we can check the temperature of this milk. Oh, yours is still going? That's okay, because we're not gonna start right away. I'm gonna go ahead and switch to experiment cam right here. So here's my milk. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and grab my digital thermometer and I'm gonna see what temperature this is. The temperature range we're looking for is around um, between 120 and 140 degrees Fahrenheit. So right now, this is 133 degrees Fahrenheit. So if yours um, is uh, kind of like warm to the touch, if it's kind of steaming, it's probably around the right temperature. If it's too hot, it will still work. The experiment will still work. And in fact, um, as soon as we do kind of our first round, we can go back and I'll do it a couple different ways. Like I'll do it if the milk is warmer than 140 degrees and we'll see uh, how that affects the experiment. So I've got my milk. It's um, between 120 and 140 degrees Fahrenheit. And in just a second, I'm gonna add my acid. So I have lemon juice right here. And um, I'm gonna use about four tablespoons. So that's about a third of a, or no, I'm sorry, that's a quarter of a cup. Um, so I have it already measured out here. And in just a second, I'm just gonna pour it right in. And as I pour it, I'm going to stir it with my spoon, and we're gonna see if we observe a reaction. So for your acid, you're gonna need four tablespoons, or a quarter cup. So here, I actually have, this is a, this is a half tablespoon. Um, so for, for this one, I would use eight, because two times four is eight. 
but you just need four tablespoons of vinegar or four tablespoons of uh, lemon juice. So I went ahead and I measured that out and I'm gonna go ahead and pour mine in. Are you guys ready? I think I'm gonna go, go ahead and get started. Oh wait, before I do that, because I have this and it's this lovely white color, which is nice and fun to see, but I think I'm gonna add just a tiny bit of food coloring. because I said that I would do that. I'm interested to see if it will stick. Again, I've never actually done it before with, uh, with food coloring. We'll have to see. I'm gonna take my acid, now that I've got this nice and dyed green, I'm gonna take my acid and I'm just going to gently pour it in. And as I'm pouring, I am also stirring. And I'm gonna see if you guys can see a reaction. either in your own experiment or the one on cam, what are you seeing? Whoa, what are you guys seeing? I think I am observing a reaction right now. <laughs> I think it does look a little gross, especially with that, um, with that green color. That does look a little bit odd, but it's very uh, vivid. It's a nice vivid color. I'm, yeah, I'm seeing some separation for sure. What we have done here is with heat, and with acid, we have separated the, uh, the protein in the milk from the, the rest of the milk. So what we've done is we've made Miss, uh, Little Miss Muffet's favorite breakfast food. We've made curds and we've made whey. The whey is the liquid, this stuff is the milk curds. The milk protein is called casein. And I'll have Caroline put that in the chat for us. This is casein protein. It's inside of uh, milk and we have extracted it. Now, depending on the temperature of your milk, your casein might look a little bit different. So mine is kind of stringy and almost even a little bit stretchy, um, but yours might look a little bit um, more kind of crumbly. It might look kind of foamy. Um, let me know how yours looks if you're, if you're doing this part. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to remove all of my um, all of my casein from my whey. So it sounds like some of us are doing crumbly, and a lot of times it's a little more crumbly and less kind of stringy depending on the temperature. So after I make this first batch, I will also make one um, where I'm not measuring the temperature of my milk, I'm just kind of using an approximate temperature that's maybe a little warmer than the one that I did use. So it sounds like we have someone who used a higher fat milk um, that's maybe a little bit more foamy and not separating as much. Um, something else that you can do if there's not as much separation is you can try adding just a little bit more acid. Um, but even if you get just a little bit of separation, that's okay because I'm going to show you a way to kind of make it a little stretchier like mine. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to filter out my uh, whey from the casein. So all I'm doing is kind of pouring it into the strainer. I'm kind of stuck to my spoon here. I'm gonna test it. It's pretty safe for me to touch. It's, a, it's not too hot. So here we go. I'm gonna put all that in here. You know, mine is a little bit crumblier. When I've made it before, sometimes it's a little bit on the stretchier side. That's interesting. There's a lot of different variables, a lot of different reasons why things turn out differently. So I have got my um, my case in plastic in here and right now it's not looking very plasticky. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm kind of squeezing out some of the liquid, right? And you're welcome to do that as well. Um, if you'd like to give it a little bit of a rinse, um, especially um, if it's if yours is smelling particularly lemon juicy or particularly vinegary, you can always just give it a quick dunk in some water like this. Not required, but it does help clean it off a little bit. So I have got my, uh, my casein now, and I'm going to take it out of my strainer so that we can see it. I'm kind of squeezing all of that liquid out or as much liquid out as I can. And here's what I've got. It's almost a little bit like Play-Doh, um, but it's kind, of, it's kind of stringy. It's a little bit, um, it is a little bit crumbly, actually. I was kind of surprised to see it was kind of crumbly. Um, but it doesn't look super duper plasticky to me, right? It's a little bit bouncy, but it doesn't seem, it doesn't seem very much like plastic or resin. So I'm gonna do one more step. Um, what I'm going to do is I am going to take my ball of casein 
and I am going to put it back in the microwave. I'm gonna put it back in my microwave safe uh, cup here. And I'm gonna put it back in the microwave for about 30 seconds. So not as long as before. I'll go ahead and take it back to my face cam here. So I'm gonna put this in for 30 seconds. And we're gonna heat it up a second time. All right, so while that's heating up, I'd love to hear how it's going for you all. Uh, and especially after that second heat, I'd love to hear how it goes. Um, when I've done this experiment in the past and read about it before, it only mentions doing the heating one time. So a lot of times the final product is kind of that crumbly stuff, which is still pretty cool. Um, but I remember uh, when I was first kind of experimenting with this, I decided to heat it a second time because I noticed as it cooled, it got a little less moldable. So um, I put it in the microwave a second time and I was really surprised with what happened. So this is pretty uh, warm right now. This is pretty hot. So I'm just going to use my spoon. But can you guys see this here? Whoa. So I'm actually going to go to my experiment cam so we can see this a little bit closer. Here is my product after I've put it in the microwave a second time. It's really stretchy. It's really, this is, now when I think about plastic, I think about something a little more like this, something that's smooth, something that's a little bit stretchy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to see if this is an okay temperature to touch. Yeah, it's a little bit warm, but this is safe for me to touch. I'm going to see if I can scoop the rest of it out. There we go, got it all out there. And I've got a really interesting product here. So having heated it a second time, it creates this nice, like smooth, stretchy material. Um, and as it cools, it'll get a little bit more, almost gummy, right? It's almost, um, almost the texture of, uh, if you've ever made slime at home before, it's a little bit like that. Uh, and what I can do with this now, if I want to, is I can um, flatten it out, I can cut it into a shape, um, or I can um, kind of just keep it as a disc like this, and I can dry it. And um, depending on the thickness, it takes different amounts of time to dry. Um, but here's one that I made, um, uh, this was actually, I made it a few uh, months ago. I made this little heart. Um, out of casein protein. And I didn't use any food coloring, but you can still kind of see how it looks. Um, and it dried fairly quickly. It really only needed overnight, um, but it made a pretty cool, um, very smooth, plasticky sort of thing. So here was my first product. And what I can do is I can put this in the microwave for additional times if I want to. Like if I want to flatten it more, um, because now it's sort of cooled and it doesn't really want to stay flattened. I can put it in additional times, but what I found is it doesn't change too much. It just kind of gets a little runnier when it's hot and then will tend to gum up and harden up a little bit like this when it's cool. So checking in with the chat, it sounds like um, some, of, uh, some of ours is kind of still liquidy. So some of ours is still kind of crumbly. Okay, let's try doing this. Let's try doing this uh, a slightly different way. I'm gonna repeat my steps. Oh, interesting. So it sounds like some of ours is still crumbly. What I'm going to do here is I am going to repeat my steps. I'm going to put in a cup of milk. I'm going to add in my acid again. And I'm going to see if I can get it a little hotter um, than I did last time. So I'm not going to measure it, but I'm going to see if I can get it a little bit hotter by microwaving it slightly longer. So I'm going to see if I can replicate a result sort of like, uh, sort of like yours. So I'm going to go ahead and take my acid. I'm doing about four tablespoons or a quarter cup. Have that at the ready because I'm going to take my milk. And I'm going to put my milk in for a minute and 40 seconds this time. While we're waiting for it, I'll go back to my face cam. It sounds like someone has tried, uh, oh, tried again with 2% milk and it worked. That's so interesting. So I did, I tried mine with fat free and it, maybe there's some difference in the different sorts of milk that you guys use if you use 1% or 2%. It sounds like it worked with 2%. The only difference between 
1% and 2%, right, is the amount of fat that's in there. And I wonder if the fat helped it become a little bit smoother. That's really interesting. I'll be, I'll be interested to see what happens with this slightly hotter mixture. So we have, um, what we have created, here's my original one. Um, it is cooled pretty quickly and it's becoming um, this kind of harder gummy sort of uh, texture. I can still rip it apart. And if I want to, I can put this back in the microwave to warm it back up, to get it more liquidy, and um, I can flatten it out or shape it into something if I want. Ooh, you guys are trying with chocolate milk? I've never tried with chocolate milk before. I'd love to know how that goes. Um, that's going to be really exciting. I'm excited to hear about that one. Um, this type of plastic, right, is not necessarily something that I could use like I use a conventional plastic. Right? Um, but it has been used um, as a plastic on an industrial level. Uh, it's called the casing plastic when it is in uh, kind of a more industrial form uh, is called galolith. And I'll have Caroline put that in the chat. Galolith is basically the same steps that we went through, but it's also tempered with um, kind of a mixture of, uh, of water and formaldehyde. And formaldehyde is a chemical that I don't really want to mess with <laughs> um, it in my home lab uh, or anywhere else really. So this is going to remain untempered. That um, also means it won't be waterproof. Um, it will, uh, if I do get it too hot, it will kind of melt again. It won't be nice and tempered like Galilith. But um, it is still pretty cool and, and I, I can tell you that it does last for a little while because I still have this after a couple months. And I even have some that I did last year, and I'll talk about that in a second. So I'm gonna take out my milk. And I know that it is hotter than last time. I'm gonna go ahead to my experiment cam once more. And I have, a, I have an ask about asking, or about using food dye for this one again. I only have the one color, and I wanna make sure that this one is a different kind of batch. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave this one undyed just for now. So I'm going to do what, just what I did last time, is I'm going to stir in, in my slightly hotter mixture, I'm going to stir in my four tablespoons. And I'm going to see what happens here. What do you think, friends? So what I'm seeing here is it's not as gloopy as before, right? It doesn't, there doesn't seem to be as much maybe. Um, and some of that has to do with, right, when the heat and the acid breaks down those protein bonds, sometimes it's just hot enough to where they don't really want to chain back up again, but we can still use this stuff. So you can see this is still kind of, um, still pretty liquidy, but I still have these little pieces. And as long as I have some of those pieces, I can still uh, use it to make my case in plastic. So I'm gonna strain it again, just like before. And yeah, I'm seeing I definitely didn't get as much. You can sort of see little pieces of the um, green plastic that I used before. So mine is kinda, it's almost like foamy. Did any of you get a result that was kind of like this one? So it just has to do with the temperature. So what I'm going to see is if on the second heat, this one will come back together. I'm really excited to try um, because I've never had one that was quite this uh, kind of like foamy and liquidy after I had done uh, the first heat. So I am excited to see if this one will melt like the other one does. So I've got my casein ball here. I go ahead and put it in my uh, microwave safe container and I'll pop it in the microwave for another 30 seconds. While we're waiting on that one, I wanted to talk about, um, this is some I made uh, actually about a year ago, um, which is why it's kind of in this uh, evergreen tree shape. Uh, about a year ago, I made this um, this case in plastic and I put it in a mold and you can see this is one I only heated one time so it was just that crumbly uh, kind of case in. I didn't do it twice so it didn't turn into that nice, where's my nice smooth little heart? It didn't turn into this nice smooth stuff. It was kind of crumbly. 
but it does stick around. Um, I found that once it is totally dried, right, there's no issue with mold or anything like that. The only thing is um, when it only has one heat, it tends to be a little more brittle. You can see it started to crack. But again, this one is going on, uh, I think about six or seven months. So this one is going on pretty strong. I'll go ahead and get out my second heat of my really crumbly plastic or my really crumbly casein. And this is really interesting. Let's see. It's still, so I'm seeing, first of all, I'm seeing um, some liquid still in the cup, so that's interesting. Looks like it separated a little bit more, took a little bit more of the whey out of there. So I've got, I've got a product that looks kind of like this now. Interesting. So it did help it a little bit, right? It helped it a little bit more um, than, than it was before, right? It's a little bit more of a nice blob now. And I bet I could heat this a couple more times to see if I could get it a little bit smoother, like my original casein blob. I'm going to go ahead back to my face cam here. So this is interesting. When it was too uh, hot to begin with, right, I got less casein out and it was kind of crumbly. Even on the second heat, it ended up being a little crumbly. So I think um, uh, what I would do next, my next step would be to try heating it one more time. I would love to see if it turns a little bit more um, smooth after that. Um, but we have talked about a lot of different things today. We talked about using one particular food to make uh, something like plastic, to make this nice uh, protein polymer. But there's other things around your kitchen that you can use too. So there's a few other things that I tried um, that I would love to share with you guys. Um, and this is something that we won't have time or and won't be able to do on the on, on lab at home today because it involves uh, needing to use a stove top. But what I've done is I have compiled a material list and an instruction sheet that I'm gonna send to all of you guys after the lab so that if you want, you can try it um, with your families over the holiday or just any time you'd like to because um, I not only used milk, to make casein protein, a uh, uh, casein protein polymer. Um, I also used gelatin. So here is um, some gelatin plastic that I made, and it's pretty firm, right? And it's pretty, uh, it's nice and it's clear. This one <laughs> um, was originally a disc, but it, when it dried, it kind of curled up a little bit. Uh, it still looks pretty cool, and again, it's really strong. Oh, I was trying to <laughs> see if I could crack it, but it's very strong this gelatin uh, uh, plastic. And then I also tried making some plastic out of starch. I used cornstarch. So here's some of my cornstarch plastic. It didn't turn out as well for me because um, I, didn't, I didn't put any glycerin in it. The one recipe that I looked at recommended, oh, use a little bit of glycerin to make it a little less brittle. But I wanted to see if I didn't have glycerin, how would it look? And the answer is maybe a little different, but it's still cool. And, and I think if I kept it from um, curling so much as it dried, my original shapes might still be there. So I made some out of cornstarch. I made some out of gelatin. Oh, where's my, um, I even made a little, uh, oh, here it is. I even made a little <laughs> ring out of gelatin plastic. So you can do a lot of kind of cool things with it. It dries overnight. Um, I have a really interesting question in the chat that I wanted to address. Did I find out a difference between lemon juice and vinegar? So in this particular, um, in this particular lab, I, I was only able to use the lemon juice. But in previous experiments, I have been able to use lemon juice and vinegar. Uh, for example, in the uh, experiment I did a year ago, um, I used vinegar on this one and lemon juice on this one. So the main difference that I found was that the one that I used vinegar on was a little bit kind of lighter in color, whereas the one I used uh, lemon juice on uh, is a little bit more yellow. So you can kind of see that. But they, um, they had more or less the same yield. They uh, took out more or less the same amount of casein. And I tested these at the same temperature, so that wasn't a factor either. Um, but I think either one works. It just might be a slight color difference. And then um, for these two that I made, um, this was one where I did a second heat. This is one where I only did one heat, so it's a little bit crumblier. Um, this one, I, I used vinegar in these. So that's a really great, great question. Um, I, I'd love to ask, did anyone get a chance to, to, uh, to, to our friends who were using chocolate milk, did you get a chance to 
to do it? Did it work? If you guys are still here, I would love to know. And if I don't find out, that's totally fine because I can do my own experiment. I just love to see, I, I wonder if it affects the color or if it affects the, um, the, the amount of casein that it's able to extract. Definitely let me know if you, uh, if you were able to do that. So that we made a lot of different types of uh, food polymers today. This is a great question. Is it edible? Um, our casein protein is technically edible. Um, it's also, this is also the, the method we might use to make ricotta cheese. So this is like a really, really simple non-fermented cheese. So you can eat it, but I wouldn't really recommend it. Um, just taking a bite of an experiment that you're making, um, especially if you use vinegar, it kind of has a, a different taste than um, ricotta cheese I think is more traditionally created with uh, with lemon juice. I didn't rinse this one super well, so it would still definitely taste very weirdly lemony. Um, and I also, of course, to do this experiment, I didn't kind of wash my hands the way that I would if I were doing food prep. Um, but technically, in a technical sense, um, this plastic is more edible than the plastic of this bowl. But friends, thank you so, so much for joining as we um, looked at some different kinds of food plastic. We, of course, um, just made casein plastic, milk plastic here with us um, on Lab at Home today. But um, if over the holiday you'd like to try out making cornstarch plastic or potato starch plastic, or gelatin plastic, I will be sending along those um, material lists and instruction lists, and I would love to hear about um, the stuff that you make. So if you do end up making something over the holiday, or if you um, end up kind of trying this experiment again, I'd love to see, uh, hear about how it goes. I'd love to see pictures. If you're interested in, um, I mean, uploading those to social media and tagging the museum and lab at home. I'd love to hear and see what you've done. You're also welcome to just send us an email. Um, I love getting uh, cool stories of stuff that people make. Um, last time I got a really, uh, really amazing uh, photograph of uh, primordial soup that someone uh, had kept from a previous experiment that we made and it was amazing. But friends, thank you so, so much for coming to Lab at Home today. Next week will be Little Lab at Home. Um, and next week on Little Lab, which is for younger scientists, we're going to be exploring different phases of water. And then not next week, but the week after, we will have another Lab at Home where we're going to be um, looking at different, testing different types of heat insulates, insulators. So that's going to be called Warm in Winter. I really hope that I can see you all next time. And thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thanks so much, friends. I can't wait to see you next time.